Welcome to the Sam and Trout Steel Adder Podcast. Today, I will be reading a book that I have found a great deal of knowledge and enjoyment in. Published by Frank Amato Publications, the same publisher of Sam and Trout Steel Adder, Great Lakes Angler, Fly Fishing, and Tying Journal, as well as over 300 books and various fishing titles. This book is called Wild Steelhead, and it is written by J.D. McPhail. It's about biology and conservation of wild steelhead, and for me in particular, it's given me a lot of insight into steelhead behavior, migration, and the history, life cycles. It's a really interesting subject for an angler, but beyond that, not just anglers, uh, people who appreciate nature and the amazing cycles that fish go through, and in this particular case, anadromous rainbow trout. So, I would like to read a few excerpts. I would highly recommend that you take a look at this book. Pick it up at amatobooks.com. That is A-M-A-T-O books.com. And this episode of the Salmon Trout Steelheader podcast is brought to you by Al's Goldfish Lures, which have been around for over 60 years. I'm personally a big fan of the neon blue color for trout and steelhead. But they go way beyond that. Check them out. Owl's Goldfish Lures. If you haven't seen them already, your grandpa probably fished them. And if he didn't, he should have. And you should as well. Check them out. Owl's Goldfish. These are a few excerpts from Wild Steelhead by J.D. McPhail. The first section that I'm going to read from Wild Steelhead is Section 3, Life Histories. There is no standard steelhead life history. Nevertheless, the most common life cycle involves a period of freshwater residence, usually in flowing water, followed by a migration to sea, a variable period of marine growth, and a return migration of adults to freshwater to spawn. The details of these migrations, and of most other life history attributes, differ among populations. This is because most steelhead return to breed at the site where they are hatched, and as a result, Natural selection has honed the life histories of different populations to fit local environmental conditions. My initial exposure to the breadth of local differences in steelhead life histories came during a field trip to the central Oregon coast in the 1960s. The trip had nothing to do with steelhead. My academic interest at this time was in the process of speciation, why and how new species are formed. By chance, one evening I camped alongside the lower Rogue River and couldn't help noticing fishermen work in the waters near my campsite. Curious, I approached one fellow and asked how he was doing. Good, he answered, the half-pounders are running. Half-pounders? I had no idea what a half-pounder was. He showed me one and explained that a half-pounder is a steelhead, but a steelhead with a life history unlike any I was used to in British Columbia. Like other steelhead, juvenile half-pounders migrate to sea after a variable period of freshwater residence. Unlike most other steelhead populations, however, half-pounders return to their river of origin in the fall. A few precocious males are mature enough after this first summer at sea, but most of the returning half-pounders are immature. So for most of these fish, this return to the river is not a breeding migration, but an overwintering migration. These fish remain in fresh water until the next spring and then migrate back to the sea where they stay for a year or two before returning to fresh water to spawn. This curious life history occurs in about five rivers in southern Oregon and northern California. It was my first inkling that some steelhead populations have life histories that are different from what I thought was a typical steelhead life history. Later, I learned that half-pounders also occur in some rivers in the Russian Far East, Kamchatka. The presence of this life history form in two widely separated geographic regions argues for the independent evolution of the half-pounder life history in these two areas. But, so far, there is no common factor that might explain why this life history evolved. Additionally, several rivers on the west central coast of Kamchatka contain up to six distinct steelhead life history types. Apparently, we still have much to learn about the evolution of steelhead life histories. When discussing life histories, deciding where to begin is a problem. Do we start at the beginning of the life cycle or the end? 
I've chosen to start with reproduction because for many steelheads, spawning marks both the beginning and the end of their life cycle. The next section I'll read is called Relationship Between Rainbow Trout and Steelhead. In the recent scientific literature, there is no argument about the specific relationship of rainbow trout and steelhead. They are a single species and usually share a common gene pool. Still, in some rivers, there are significant allele frequencies, differences between coexisting resident rainbows and steelhead. This argues that in some places and at some times there are barriers to gene flow between resident rainbow trout and steelhead. Sometimes there are differences in peak spawning times, although their spawning periods usually overlap to some degree. Also, differences in their body size can translate into differences in water velocities and gravel size at their spawning sites, and male size differences can affect their access to females in a way that results in steelhead males pairing with steelhead females and most resident rainbow males pairing with resident rainbow females. Thus, size-related factors can result in some reproductive isolation between the two life history forms. However, such barriers usually are incomplete. For example, although steelhead males may deny rainbow trout access to steelhead females, trout often sneak fertilizations during steelhead spawnings. It is rare, however, for steelhead males to pair with resident rainbow females. Consequently, the mothers of resident rainbows usually are rainbow trout, and the mothers of steelhead usually are steelhead. However, the sires of steelhead can be resident rainbow males. Furthermore, within a river system, but in different years, the extent of reproductive isolation between resident rainbow trout and steelhead is affected by environmental conditions and the relative numbers of the two life history forms on the spawning sites. Thus, in rivers containing both life history forms, the frequency of hybridization between resident rainbows and steelhead probably fluctuates from year to year. In Kanchatka, the situation is even more complicated. Here, three rivers that flow into the Sea of Okhotsk contain six different life history forms. Furthermore, in some of the rivers, these life history forms spawn at the same time and in the same place. In such situations, about 30% of the pairings involve different life history forms. Something similar happens in the only confirmed steelhead population in the Southern Hemisphere. This population in the Rio Santa Cruz in Patagonia, Argentina, was introduced about 25 generations ago, and the original introductions involved both anadromous and non-anadromous populations. Researchers in Argentina use the ratios of strontium to calcium in otoliths to confirm anadromy. The ratios of these elements differ depending on whether the fish has or has not been to sea. A high ratio of strontium to calcium indicates a marine phase in the life history. Fry derived from anadromous females also have higher strontium to calcium ratios than the fry derived from freshwater resident females. Consequently, it is possible to determine whether the mothers of individual fry were anadromous or non-anadromous. The Santa Cruz data clearly shows that both anadromous and freshwater resident steelhead coexist in this river system. The adults of the two life history forms differ dramatically in size, longevity, and the number of repeat spawnings. However, both forms can and do give rise to the other form. In other words, this river contains a single population with two alternative life history forms. It is not clear if the frequencies of the two forms are stable, or what we see now is an unstable transitional state where one of the forms will eventually replace the other. The last section I will read is about spawning. Female steelhead choose the spawning sites and prefer sites with subgravel flows or downwelling water. For example, tailouts of pools and the outlets of lakes even in remarkably small lake-headed streams. Once she has chosen a site, the female excavates a depression in the gravel by turning on one side and beating her tail against the gravel bottom. This digging motion creates a vortex that loosens and lifts gravel and sand that is then moved downstream by the current. The size of gravel moved is variable and depends on female size and water velocity. Steelhead typically spawn in faster and deeper water than rainbow trout. In tributaries of the Coal River, Kamchatka, both steelhead and freshwater resident rainbow trout spawn in the same low-gradient meandering 
tundra streams. Usually the size of gravel moved in steelhead nest construction is larger than the gravel moved by trout. However, both rainbow trout and steelhead in the Coal River spawn in similar sized gravel, probably because small gravel is the only suitable substrate available in these low gradient streams. In the later stages of nest excavation, the female begins to probe the nest by erecting her anal fin and crouching down into the deepest part of the nest. This crouching behavior provides the female with information on the depth of the nest, but it also attracts males. Experiments with painted wooden models of females show a striking difference in male response. Males ignore models placed above a nest, but are strongly attracted to models placed at the bottom of a nest. This is really just a small piece of the incredible information offered in Wild Steelhead, the book. Check it out at amatobooks.com. There is so much more to learn from this book. In particular, I really enjoy the sections on steelhead migration, and I encourage you to study this incredible book, Wild Steelhead by J.D. McPhail.